it was through the IH um, grants program that we were able to partner with Chicago Children's Theater back, I think nearly a year ago to further develop this partnership uh, between CCT and the Lurie Children's Center for Childhood Resilience. Honestly, we are honored, honored to be affiliated with this work. Um, the mission of IH is to strengthen the social, political, and economic fabric of Illinois through constructive conversation and community engagement. Um, founded in 1973, we carry out this mission today through a number of initiatives, a few of which I'll name. The Odyssey Project, where income eligible adults have the opportunity to go through a full year of college credit courses in the humanities, which I guarantee you is a life-changing experience. Envisioning Justice, which is a network of collaborations with community-based agencies that employs the arts and humanities to help people rethink the multiple impacts of our current criminal legal system. Facilitation training for nonprofit leaders across the state. Uh, Road Scholars, which is a roster of speakers on humanities topics who are willing to come and deliver talks at venues across the state. And finally, the grants program, um, which I oversee and which has been around uh, since our beginning. Um, so without any further ado, Welcome to the third webinar in this series titled Trauma-Informed Arts Curriculum for Early Education. Our moderator today is Julia DeVettencourt, who serves as the Director of Arts Education for Chicago Public Schools, the third largest school district in the U.S. Prior to joining CPS in early 2018, Julia served as program director for Snow City Arts, an organization that provides standards-based arts education to children and youth in Chicagoland hospitals. Julia has devoted her career to ensuring every student, regardless of circumstance, has access to a high quality arts education. And so without any further ado, I'm gonna hand things over to Julia. Julia? Thank you so much. Good afternoon, everybody. It's wonderful to be with you. Thank you so much, Mark, for that kind introduction. I'm really pleased to be part of this conversation today. I think this topic is critical and sits at the nexus of so many important sectors, mental health, arts education, early childhood education. And I have just a couple of brief framing thoughts, uh, but really looking forward to being in dialogue with you today. So I know in some ways um, this moment has brought us to this conversation, but the need for this work is not new. And I hope that we emerge from today's conversation and from 2020, uh, affirming our commitment to work like this and moving forward together. I also want to acknowledge that in many ways, this is still an emerging field. And I, like you, am excited to be amongst colleagues listening and learning together. And related to that, I, I already see from looking at the attendees that the spirit of collective impact and community partnership is in the room today, the virtual room. And speaking for CPS and from experience, I know that we do our best work when we rely on each other, our families, our communities, and our partners in every neighborhood in service of supporting our youngest learners. So thank you so much for the work that you do. And as a new parent myself, uh, thank you so much for your focus on early childhood education. I'd like to introduce our contributors today, starting with Jacqueline Russell, who is the co-founder and artistic director of Chicago Children's Theater, who in 2010 was appointed by the US State Department to serve as cultural envoy to Canada was honored with the 2003 Hero of the Year Award from the Chicago chapter of Autism Speaks and was recently honored as one of 20 women who have shaped arts and culture in Chicago on the Carrie James Marshall mural Rushmore at the Chicago Cultural Center. Next, I'd like to introduce Micah Figueroa, a Chicago-based teaching artist, actor, director, and choreographer. As an actor, Micah was most recently in 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea and Moby Dick at Looking Glass Theater. Micah is a frequent collaborator with Walkabout Theater, having most recently performed in Tall Girl and the Lightning Parade, and has worked with Writers Theater, Erasing the Distance Theater Company, and many others. As a teaching artist, Micah has been fortunate enough to work with students ranging from kindergarten through college investigating and expanding their physical limits for nearly eight years. Welcome, Micah. Next, Terry Guest. 
is an actor, a playwright, and a teaching artist based in Chicago, Illinois. His play, At the Wake of a Dead Drag Queen, is a Spectrum Series grant winner and will be having its world premiere, had its world premiere with the Story Theater in 2019. Other plays include Marie Antoinette and Magical Negroes and Tootsie Roll. Some of Terry's acting credits include One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest at the Alliance Theater, Marcus or The Secret of Sweet at Actors Express, and I and You at Arts Garage. Welcome, Terry. And Lizzie May is a Chicago native artist and educator. As a full-time teacher in Chicago public schools, Lizzie developed a trauma responsive curriculum that guided students through the process of devising original theater pieces. As a playwright and founder of the nonprofit Backyard Chicago Ensemble, she has devised several theater pieces in an intergenerational ensemble. In her work at Chicago Children's Theater, she has developed curricula, assessment materials, and trauma responsive workshops, and teaches classes and camps as a teaching artist. Welcome to our entire panel. And now I am thrilled to hand things over to Jacqueline Russell to introduce the project and kick us off. Thank you. Thank you for that uh, wonderful introduction. Welcome, everybody. Uh, today, I just want to kick us off a bit. Uh, this is our final webinar, and we're going to share with you the trauma-informed drama residency that Chicago Children's Theater has designed for young children with our colleagues, the experts from Lurie Center for Childhood Resilience. Uh, so those are the folks you met in our first webinar. Uh, back in 2016 at Chicago Children's Theater, we created a musical adaptation of Matt De La Pena's Last Stop on Market Street for our main stage season. Uh, Matt is a tremendous children's book author and uh, someone that we love his work and we followed him for many years. Uh, right after um, that production, uh, he had written an essay for Time Magazine called Why We Shouldn't Shield Children from Darkness. In this essay, he speaks specifically about an illustration that his editor thought was too dark for the book and was encouraging Matt to remove the illustration. Matt really searched his soul, did a lot of thinking about that particular illustration uh, and decided that no, this really needed to stay in the book and won that battle to keep that piece in. Um, Matt. Uh, talks about in this essay, which we're sharing a link in the chat, um, about the need for the arts and literature in particular, in his instance, to really speak truthfully to children and to let children know that they are seen, that they are safe, and that they are resilient. This book, Love, uh, became a great inspiration to us at the Children's Theater, and we shared this book with our friends and experts at Lurie. We then got very excited about creating some type of unit together that we could bring into the Chicago Public Schools to address trauma. And we then went to our colleagues and to Mark in particular at the Illinois Humanities uh, to put together a grant to seek funding for us to do this work. So we were able to then bring the artists that you have on the panel today together with the experts from Lori to start working together to collaborate on a curriculum using this book, Love, as the centerpiece. We took each of the photos, the, the images in the book that we were really moved by and tried to correspond them to different guiding principles from the CCR toolkit. Uh, we talked about that in our first session. If you recall, some of those guiding principles are creating a safe environment, building relationships and connectedness, and supporting and teaching emotion regulations. So uh, unfortunately, due to COVID, we haven't been able to bring this unit into the classrooms yet. But our plan is to be able to be back in the classrooms as soon as it is safe. So what we're going to share with you today are a number of activities and lesson plans. And we thought that we would start by sharing with you the book, Love. Start. This is Jamie, who's going to read us a story. Hi. In the beginning, there is light and two wide-eyed figures standing near the foot of your bed and the sound of their voices is love. A cab driver plays love softly on his radio while you bounce in backs with the bumps of the city and everything smells new and it smells like 
life. Love, too, is the smell of crashing waves and a train whistling blindly in the distance. And each night, the sky above your trailer turns the color of love. In a crowded concrete park, you toddle towards summer sprinklers while older kids skip rope and run up the slide. And soon, you are running among them, and the echo of your laughter is love. On the night the fire alarm blares, you're pulled from sleep and whisked into the street where a quiet old lady is pointing to the sky. Stars shine long after they've flamed out, she tells you, and the shine they shine with is love. But it's not only stars that flame out, you discover. It's summers, too, and friendships and people. One day you find your family nervously huddled around the TV, but when you ask what happened, they answer with silence and shift between you and the screen. In your dreams that night, you are searching for a love that seems lost. You open and close drawers, lift cushions, empty old toy bins, but there's nothing. You wake with a start in the arms of a loved one who bends to your ear and whispers, it's okay, it's okay. It's love. And in time, you learn to recognize a love overlooked, a love that wakes at dawn and rides to work on the bus, a slice of burned toast that tastes like love. And it's love in each deep crease of your grandfather's face as he lowers himself onto an overturned bucket to fish. And it's love in the rustling leaves of gnarled trees lined behind the flower fields. And it's love in the made up stories your uncles tell in the backyard between wild horseshoe throws. And the man in rags outside the subway station plays love notes that lift into the sky like tiny beacons of light. And the face staring back in the bathroom mirror, this too, is love. So when the time comes for you to set off on your own, heavy winds will sweep past your building and great gray clouds will congregate above. Your loved ones will stand there like puddles beneath their umbrellas, holding you tight and kissing you and wishing you luck. Because it won't be luck you'll leave with, because you'll have love. You'll have love, love, love. Hello, everyone. I love to hear that book again. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about how we used that book and the information that we got from the specialists at Lori to create the four units that we're then going to share with you. Um, so Jamie's going to show us some slides that will clarify this process, but I'm just going to keep talking. We started from the perspective that theater offers tools that can map onto what um, students who are exposed to chronic and acute trauma need in order to build coping skills and um, self-regulation. Um, our partners at Lurie really, I mean, floored me, and I'm sure you've seen in some of these earlier webinars about the impact of trauma on the early childhood brain. Um, most of my work had been in middle school previously, and um, there, while there are a plethora of resources for middle school and high school age students, we saw a significant gap with regards to young, young, young minds. Even though trauma is shaping their minds so significantly, um, there are not as many resources to address that. So um, we can move to the next slide. Yes, how can we make children feel safe, capable, likable, and lovable? And we started this work um, at the very beginning of quarantine. So recognizing that there were significant limitations on um, all of our lives and all of students' lives and significant dysregulation happening that kind of informed even the like um, nitty gritty of what we created. Can we move to the next one? What do we want to put into our students' invisible backpack that they're carrying with them? Um, beliefs about themselves, the adults who care for them and the world. So these three tiers of um, self-love, who you can turn to in situations and what the world has to offer you were things that came up again and again in our process and that you'll see spelled out in our units. We can move to the next. Okay, so the Lurie um, materials had three 
focus is, which we're creating a safe environment, building relationships and connectedness and supporting and teaching emotion regulation. So starting from a theater background, we asked ourselves, what can theater tools speak to in each of these areas? Um, and starting from the belief in the power of our own stories and in the power of the communal presence of the specific people in the room, we did a lot of story sharing about how we felt as kids, how the book made us feel, and partnered that with the information that we got from Lori to shape the exercises that we are going to share with you. Um, we recognize that a lot of theater games teach tuning into the body, identifying emotion, and then um, coming from a brave place to share that emotional regulation and identification with others. So we wove those exercises throughout everything. Um, we also recognized that, like I grew up in Chicago, so my whole life there, in terms of creating a safe environment, where you are in concrete space is not always safe. It's not always going to be quiet. It's not always going to be peaceful. So we thought, how can we use the imaginative faculties of theater making to guide students into creating an internal safe space where they know they can always turn? And I'm gonna lead you through one of those exercises in a moment. So that was our first unit. We thought, how can students create mentally or through physical five sense grounding their own happy place. The second unit we created is about asking for help, um, which is uses the illustrations of the book to ask the question, who is for you? Who is around you that you can turn to? Who is around you that you can trust? What does it look like to feel really scared? And how do we build the vocabulary of asking for help? Um, and Terry's gonna share an exercise from that unit. Our third unit, making friends with fear. Again, coming from this hyper-realistic place that fear is always going to be with us. It's not gonna be something that we're able to be rid of, but how can we attune to it within our bodies and then use physical activities, imaginative activities and emotional activities to interact with that fear in a loosened or lightened way. And so Micah is gonna lead you through an activity around that. And then our fourth unit is resilience because um, you know, all of us probably know about the significance of resilience in students that are, in all students, but especially in students that are um, exposed to trauma. And so our fourth unit asks the question, how can we build the capacity to use these tools in real ways? So we're guiding really, really young minds through these activities and bodies and imaginations through these activities of how can I feel safe within myself? Who can I ask for help? How can I, um, engage in a friendly way with my own feelings of fear? And then how can I name what I have in my own toolbox and use that? So we have a series of activities. Um, we'll guide you through one of each section. In our curriculum, we have several for each section so that the teaching artist could pick and choose what's most appropriate for the classroom and then implement them. Okay, that's that. I'm gonna hand it over to Micah for the opening ritual. Beautiful, okay, great. So like I said, feel free to, uh, ooh, hello. Okay, perfect. Can you all see the screen and Micah now? Yeah, yes. beautiful. Okay, I got a flurry of yeses. Fantastic. Okay. All right, so uh, what do we do? What do we do? When our feelings inside. When, when our, our feelings inside. inside. Feel so bad we could bite. Feel so bad we could bite. Bite. We could bite. We take three breaths. We take, take three, take three breaths. breaths. And sing this song. And sing, and sing this, this song. song. When I'm scared, I make a happy place. When I'm, when I'm scared, scared, I make a happy, happy place. place. When I'm lonely, find a friendly face. When, when I'm, I'm lonely, lonely, find a friendly face. I can feel my feelings <laughs> big and small. I can, I can feel, feel my feelings big and small. small. And my love inside is stronger than all. And my love, my love inside, inside is stronger, stronger than, than all. all. I am worthy. I am worthy. I am special. And do whatever you want here. I'm special. I'm special. I'm special. I am genius. I am genius. I am full of love. I am full, full of, of love. love. Yes, thank you everybody <laughs> who just joined. I appreciate that. I feel good. <laughs> okay, great. Yes, Jamie, can we go back to the slides for that image? 
Okay, beautiful. Um, so I'm gonna lead you guys through this and you can do it in your own spaces and you don't need to see me. You can just kind of um, listen and I'll lead it as if I was leading a group of kids. Okay, you guys, I'm looking at this page and I see this girl and she's laying in such a beautiful field with these beautiful flowers and the sun is shining on her and she looks comfy. And I'm thinking, that's not how my house looks like. That's not how it feels when I'm in my room. Sometimes it's messy. Sometimes there's other people or noises inside or outside, or sometimes I feel so anxious inside my head and my thoughts are really loud. But I have a question, you guys. Do you think, could this be happening in her imagination? Do you think so? Do you think maybe that she's imagining herself in this field? Wouldn't that be so cool if any time that you were somewhere that was loud or scary or chaotic, you could close your eyes and breathe and use your imagination? Okay, I think that we should try it. So everybody make sure that you're comfortable and make sure that you can um, breathe and you can kind of wiggle and get it all out and shake, 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 shake. And then you're just gonna put your hands on your tummy and you're gonna breathe in and breathe out. And breathe in and breathe out. So good. Okay, if you feel ready, you can close your eyes. I want you to imagine that you're walking outside and you can feel the sun and you can feel the wind and you're going somewhere. And you can look around and you can see maybe there's trees, maybe there's a castle, maybe there's bubbles, maybe the ground feels really squishy or maybe it's like your favorite street and you can feel it, but really notice how does it feel like to be walking and you know you're going somewhere. Okay, you're coming to a fork in the road and you can choose, are you gonna turn right or are you gonna turn left? If you hate choosing, you can just turn left, but if you wanna choose, you can choose which way to go. And you're just gonna walk a little more and then you're there and you look around and you're in the most beautiful place you can think of. And I want you to notice what the air feels like on your skin. And I want you to make sure you're breathing still really in your belly. And you're gonna sit down or lay down in this special place. You're doing so good. And I want you to notice if you can smell anything, is there a really nice smell, something comforting or something pretty? And I wonder if you can feel anything with your feet or your hands or your back, if it's soft or grassy or what it feels like and you're still breathing. And I wonder if you can hear anything, if you can hear like maybe there's some light music or chirping or maybe it's totally silent. And you're just sitting or laying in this special magical place and you're the only person there. And when you're there, it feels so good. Like you know that everything's okay. And you know that you're by yourself and you're safe. And if you want to, you can kind of like, just use your imagination to turn your head and see what you see. And see if there's any colors there, any flowers. And now I wonder if you can use your imagination to taste the best taste you can think of. If it's marshmallows or maybe chocolate or something delicious. And while you're tasting that and you're breathing, I'm gonna count down from 10. And when I count down from 10, when I say zero, 
you're going to open your eyes and you're going to be back exactly where you are. And you're going to know that you can come back here in your imagination whenever you want because you're an artist and you can imagine the most beautiful thing, okay? 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, zero. Thank you, everybody. You did so, 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 so good. I'm so proud of you. Thank you so much, Lizzie. That was wonderful. And as a reminder to our attendees, if you have questions that you'd like to make sure that we um, talk about after we move through a couple more exercises, please pop them in the chat. We are monitoring that um, so that we can make sure we're bringing your thoughts forward. Uh, but now I'm excited to turn things over to Terry for our next exercise. Hello, everybody. And also, I have to say, I saw that uh, Olivia is here, who is someone that I really love and admire so much. And I learned I got all of my passion for theater for very young audiences from her. So thank you for coming. Um, secondly, in this picture, can you go to the book, Jamie? Thank you. Something that I really love about this picture is that everyone looks so happy and it's very clear to me that everyone is depending on somebody else. You can see from the very, the people in the back, the firemen in the back and all of the kids up front, there are younger kids involved, there are older kids involved. And it made me think about some ways that, and some of the people in my life who I can run to when I'm feeling maybe a little afraid or a little lonely, which is happening a lot right now. Um, so, this exercise requires a little bit of pre-planning. So I need you to grab a piece of paper if you can and a pen or a pencil or a crayon or a marker if, or highlighter, whatever you have. Um, and I'm gonna be sending all of these to the Chicago Art Institute. So make sure that you're really giving me your best work. Um, I, I expect nothing less. So first, I want you to think about some of the people in your life or a person in your life that is a safe place for you. Now this person can be a parent, but they don't have to be. They could be an older sibling, they can be a friend, they can be a teacher, they can be a counselor or a person from your church or a cousin, it does anyone really. Um, so think of this person, I'll give you 10 seconds to picture their faces in your minds. 10, nine, eight, seven, really picture them. Six, picture what does the hair look like? Five, am I, I'm probably off on my numbers. Four, three, picture what are they wearing? Two, one. Now you have 30 seconds, draw this person. Ready, set, go. And I'm timing you. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Ah, time's up. <laughs> okay, Jamie, can you pull up our videos for a moment? All right, I'm gonna I'm gonna pick on some of my friends here. Uh, Mike, uh, show me your picture. Ooh, now, now if you don't mind, who is this person? So this is a very rough sketch of my longtime best friend, Simon. Um, he and I, uh, like, we met when, when I was like 13, he was 14, and actually in the, in the first theater show I ever did, which was like another like life changing point, we met then and pew, like done a bunch of really cool stuff together since then. Uh, and he is, is in, in Texas uh, still. Uh, and he runs a bird training company with his wife. Oh, oh wow. A bird training company? Bird training company, yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, Micah, uh, <laughs> if you had to describe something about your friend that uh, makes you feel safe with him in one word, only one, what word would you use? Ooh. 
resourceful. Mm. I'm sorry? Resourceful. Resourceful. Yeah. <laughs> that is a really, really good word. Yeah. So now I'm going to challenge everyone to do the same thing. To pick a word. It doesn't have to be as brilliant as resourceful. I mean, you know, it's hard to beat Micah. But pick a word that describes this person that you feel safe with. Now, I know that a lot of you are five. So don't worry. I have a word bank that I will put in the chat for you if you have some um if you have a hard time coming up with words but words like kind brave maybe funny maybe they're silly or loving um thoughtful patient maybe they're patient with you maybe they're helpful or any other words that you can come up with so once you have that word in your mind um lizzie what is it can you do if you don't mind can you show your person and tell me um you, what word you came up with this is my picture. It's really good. Oh my God. Yeah. <laughs> um, I said that this person is smart. Smart. Um, let's, what about you, Julia? Did you, did you have a chance to draw? <laughs> Gentle. To draw, but not to unmute. <laughs> so um, this is my, my photo of my grand, my picture of my grandmother. Um, and she makes me feel wise. Ooh, wise. That is a great one. Um, what about you, Jackie? Would you mind sharing if listens? Thank you. <laughs> uh, yes, I, I, uh, it was my, um, a picture of my best friend in my imagination and she listens. Mm, thank you. She listens. So all of these qualities are really incredible and really beautiful and really important. And that's why we love and trust these people. But as we all know, sometimes you can't always have your grandmother there or your best friend there or your dog there, right? But I bet that you have some of these same qualities inside of yourselves. I promise you, I'm serious. I know you don't believe me, but I promise you do and I'm gonna prove it to you. So I want you to look at whatever word you came up with. So the word that I decided was also smart, Lizzie, so wonderful. Um, and I want you to show me, not with your words, but with your body, what it looks like to be wise or resourceful or to listen or to be smart or whatever it was that your word is. Ready? On the count of three, I want you to show me. One, two, three. Ooh, so now I want you to pick one more and show me what it looks like to be something that your friend chose, maybe a word you did not choose. So for example, uh, I will choose gentle. One, two, three. <laughs> Perfect, thank you everybody. Thank you so much. Uh... Terry, and, and thank you for getting me, me thinking about people in my life that I love. Um, I'm going to keep us moving, um, and I'm excited now to pass things over to Micah for our next exercise. Thank you all very much. Um, so yes, uh, our this little chunk is making friends with fear. And like Lizzie set us up perfectly before, fear is has this special power that we all have felt before in many different ways to just stop us to just make us, because we have the freeze, flight or fight response whenever we have fear. And the, the ways to push through that is to get closer and closer and closer and to get more acquainted with how to deal with that feeling when we have it. Because unlike animals, we all feel fear. Unlike animals though, we feel it for like human stuff, right? That we can't really control. So um, this is also a participatory thing uh, as well. And I'm gonna need some of my, uh, my, my panelists to, to um, help me out a little bit. This is the fear monster um, exercise. And let's actually, I'm gonna, I'll read the, the, the page that this was inspired by first. Um, you see a, a picture here of a, a young child being held by um, an older woman's uh, arm, maybe their mom, it could be their older sister. Um, you wake with a start in the arms of a loved one who bends to your ear and whispers, it's okay, it's okay, it's love. Um, so, here is how this game will work. If we were in a larger space, the rules would be different. So this is an adaptation for Zoom. Um, can I have all of my uh, uh, my participants 
uh, we're going to use our our happy place as our safe space, and we're going to use that in our bodies. Can everybody? And I did this with the opening um, uh, thing. So whenever we put our hands over our head like this, we're in our safe space. But it's not just enough to be in the safe space. We need to be active inside of it, and we're going to be active by breathing. So what I want you to do is not hyperventilate, not not try to take all the breaths in the world at once. But when you're in your safe space, look down inside inside your belly again, and just breathe deep, and notice what's happening. But I want to make sure that you're audibly breathing though. So if you have your hands over your head, we can hear your breath just a little bit, right? And when, in your, when you're in your safe space and your happy place, you're totally safe from the fear monster. Now, to represent the rest of everyday life, I need everybody else now. Um, if we we're doing this in a room, I'd have you way back in the back of the class and we'd be walking towards me as the fear monster. And the first person to come up to me and actually tag me like red light, green light would win. Here, we have to do it for it. So, here, can I get everybody to come up with your favorite dance move? So wherever you are, you are doing your dance, which means you're in the groove of life, whatever it is, whatever it is, you're in the, there we go, nice. See, it can be super simple. You got some shoulder actions, fantastic. One day we'll hit the dance floor together again. All right, so here this game works. I am now the fear monster, if you can all see. So the fear monster, would wear something like this. So it could be, be anything that the teacher wants it to be, and it could be something more simple than this. I just threw this together a little bit. It's a lot of fun. Here's how the game works. You will be dancing, and you're gonna keep dancing the whole time. I'm gonna be turned away this way as a fear monster. When I turn back around and see you, I'm sorry, I'm going to say a color first, a color, when I'm when my back turned. If you are wearing on your body that color, and I'm talking about, it could be socks, it could be it could be any color, and you got to be honest with yourself because we can only see you know shoulders. If you're wearing any of those colors, you have to go to your safe space because if I turn around and I spot a color that is that somebody's wearing and they're not in their safe space, I'm going to call you and you'll be out. Okay. So if you're wearing the color I call out, go to your safe space. But as I turn around and you're not wearing the color, you still have something to do. You have to freeze in place and you have to watch and you have to look at how the fear monster is looking for everybody else and i just want you to notice what happens with the fear monster okay here we go we're gonna give it a couple of shots um and i'm gonna try to okay i can't see everybody still so i'm trusting that everybody's participating all right so whenever i turn my back go ahead and start your dance oh i can't see it but i know that's some good there's some good moves yep we're grooving we're grooving blue very nice. Oh, oh, let's see. Let's see. Okay. I don't see anybody who is where. Oh, actually, you know what? I think Julia, are those blue glasses you're wearing? Ah, there we go. There we go. Now this is kind of tricky too, because we didn't give you a chance to like notice all the different things you're wearing, but that, but as a good example, first example, well done. I cast you back inside the game. You can keep playing. Very nice. Let's do it a couple more times. Ready? So we're going to turn back around. And go ahead and dance, go ahead and dance. Life is good, life is groovy, life is happy, life is, life is amazing. And green, whew, let's see, let's see. Oh, nice, oh, I could have got a Terry. I could have got a Terry, but I didn't, I didn't. And he's breathing, that's great, that's fantastic. Let me see, anybody else? I can't see anybody else, fantastic. All right, last time, last time. We could be dancing, we could be the grooving. There we go, there we go, very good, and Red. Ooh, Lizzie was quick on that. Lizzie was super quick on that. I saw that. I saw that. Anybody else? Ooh, and everybody else is stone still. Excellent. Nice. Very cool. And so that'll be the edit for the exercise. And here's how this actually jumps in. One of the reasons I love this exercise, and we can talk more about this later, is just for the briefest of seconds, we get to experience that that sharp spinal like spurt of fear for just a second. And when we practice getting closer to, uh, to, to, to making friends with fear, we have to be able to simulate that experience in a safe way. So us being able to practice that in that, in that what do I do in the moment helps us to train how to uh, enter into that space by breathing and making sure that we're taking care of ourselves. Thanks y'all. Thank you so much, Micah. And now I know what color my glasses are too. <laughs> <laughs> I thought they were blue, yeah. Oh, no, you're right. You're right. Also, you were the only face I really saw. So when I turned it, I first saw it, I was like, oh, blue, right there. Well done. Well done. Thank you so much. And now I'm going to pass things over to Jackie Russell for our fourth exercise. Okay. 
Thank you. Uh, so in this section, we are talking about resilience and uh, let's get our image up. Okay. Um, I wanted to answer a question quickly that somebody had in um, the, the chat was uh, about the age uh, for this unit. And we're really targeting um, pre-K uh, through first grade. Uh, so this is called the thought bubble talk bubble. And I kept this as a little mystery for everybody. This is actually the image in the book that Matt De La Pena uh, had to convince uh, the editor to leave in the book. Um, as you can see, this is a pretty dramatic scene that's happening. Uh, so I would like to ask people to, all of you uh, participants, uh, attendees to write in the chat, uh, let me know what it is, what do you see in this picture? What are some of the feelings that you see? What do you think is happening here? Let's see if we can get some responses. The world caving in, fear, abandonment, isolation, overturned furniture, scared, lost, the safety protection of a dog, fighting, abandonment, the dog being a friend, adult chaos, disaster, fight with a father, violence, sadness, fear, love, Adults who've lost control, domestic violence. Yes, being too small, where is safety? Uh, these are all great. Uh, yes, drinking perhaps, helpless. So now let's look at, let's look at the, the center of this image. We see a little boy and a dog. So now we're going to think about what, what is that little boy thinking? What, is, what do you think that little boy could be saying to himself in his mind? Let's think of a little thought bubble for him. Stop, stop, stop. I'm scared. I'm okay, not again. I'm not safe. This always happens. Don't hurt us, it's my fault. I love my dog. I want to be invisible. Did I do it? Why is this happening? I'm sorry. I don't ever want to be like them. Is this my fault? Okay, so these are all of the things that perhaps are going on inside this little boy's head right now. Things that we might say to ourselves sometimes when something bad is happening around us. Now let's all imagine that we're his dog, his friend. What are some of the things that if this dog could talk, what would this dog say? I love you, I'm here, I got you, I'm here for you, I got your back, you're safe, I got you, I'll protect you, I'll take care of you, you're okay, we're together. Hi friends, you're my best friend, I'm with you. You can talk to me. Hugs. Great. So uh, we would start um, this exercise by going through all of this, um, talking through it, coming up with, with the language. Um, and then we invite the children to take turns being the little boy who needs the comforting, who needs to share what's going on inside of him, perhaps. And then uh, the dog who is the comforter. And so the children get to switch back and forth in role playing around the scene. So um, that is that lesson. And uh, yeah, and then again, this is a, a moment within the unit where we can look at a lot of the other activities that we now have in our toolkit um, that we can now use with us, like going to our happy place, like facing fear, sharing our feelings, labeling emotions, et cetera. Thank you so much, Jackie. Well, Terry, I think it's time for a closing ritual before we open it up to some question and answer. Yes, and um, Lizzie, can I pick on you? Can I make you the entire class? Oh yeah, definitely. Um, and everyone else, feel free to do this, but uh, I will just make Lizzie the one that we can hear. Uh, and Jamie, can you spotlight me, please? Thanks. Uh, okay, cool. So. After a, a, a class period of this, hopefully we will be talking about some 
some things that might be a little scary or some some things that might make people feel a little tense. And I believe that storytelling is a really powerful uh, tool. So we will end each class with a story. So Lizzie, this is also a call and response similar to our opening ritual. So uh, do as I do and say. <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> thank you, thank you, thank you. There once was a kid who had a pet snake. There once was a kid who had a pet snake. Who cradled them to sleep and shook them awake. Who cradled them to sleep and shook them awake. But one chilly morning, the snake wasn't there. But one chilly morning, the snake wasn't there. They looked up and down. They looked everywhere. They looked up and down. They looked everywhere. My friend is gone, they said. Why, why, why? My friend is gone, they said. Why, why, why? They sat on the ground. We would sit on the ground. And they started to cry. They sat on the ground and they started to cry. They cried so loud that people would stare. They uh, cried so loud that people would stare. Mm. And say, what's going on with that kid over there? And say, what's going on with that kid over there? But they looked up at the sky and saw a big bird. But they looked up at the sky and they saw a big bird. And they stood up, shook it off, happy to be heard. And they stood up, shook it off, happy to be heard. They did a turn around and a dance to, who are we dancing to, Lizzie? Beyonce. They did, good answer. They did a turn around and a dance to Beyonce. <laughs> they did a turn around and a dance to Beyonce. And they danced, 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 danced all the way home. And they danced, 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 danced all the way home. Yes, and then we would love and hug each other one day when we can do that again. Thank you so much, Terry. And thank you to all of our panelists for taking us through those exercises. If you have any questions for our panelists, please pop them in the chat now. I certainly know I have a few, so I will take it upon myself to kick it off. I would be curious to know across this entire toolkit, if you're entering a community for the first time, if you're meeting our, our, some young learners for the first time, where do you suggest you start? Which exercise do you think is most suited to meeting a new group of kids and why? I would say that I would start with any of the imaginative exercises. So basically we just took a book and I, and this is something that we talked about earlier, but is really, this is really applicable to anyone. You could take any book that you're passionate about and do this. We just took a book and made up some exercises that we thought sounded fun. Um, so I think any of the imaginative exercises are really good for groups of students that maybe you don't know as well yet, because it allows them to create their own safe safety and they can they don't have to tell you anything that they don't want to and in that same vein too uh i agree completely with terry too um but jackie's exercise i know it's resilience in an hour diagram we have it as the last one which is still important but the idea of looking at a picture and being able to offer my own thoughts and fill in the blanks um again starts the student in a giving mode of being like, okay, I have to actually like contribute. I have to think about what I see and what I can respond to, which is bu building trust. It's building and, and, and already is helping them to establish what is safe for themselves and is the very first gauge. So I would say like, if there's any sort of, not just that doesn't have to be the thoughtful, but an, a, a look at the picture and analysis and a discussion of what's happening and letting kids, you know, fill in their own answer. Thanks to both of you, Jackie and Lizzie, anything to add? Um, I would just add that the, we designed the curriculum so that there was always gonna be the same um, activity at the very beginning, which was what Micah led us through. So that no matter what, we're establishing a container that is the same every time. So that introducing with this ritual that's re repetitive and repeatable, and then entering into the book to do exactly as Micah was saying, an interactive read aloud, which is something that any five or six year old will recognize from their teacher. So already you're giving them a ritual that lets them know it's a theater making space. It's silly, it's goofy, we're using our bodies. Then you're doing something that they'll recognize that will be, I mean, ideally soothing. And then once you've established that container and um, boundary, you're introducing 
new theater activities. And I'm a billion percent with Terry on starting with the individual space before we're venturing into any sort of um, partner work, which I think is why we put safe space first, because we also want to build an internal toolkit before we're even asking them to look outside of themselves. Thank you so much. Jackie, I think the next question I have would be for you. I, I heard Terry mention that you, you know, you selected a book that was meaningful to you. You know, I see we have a lot of, of teaching artists, museum educators here. If they're thinking about sort of the, the books in, that are in their space, what do you think is critically important if you're going to use a book as a primary source? Uh, yeah, so I think, and I saw some people writing about this in the chat too. I think um, books where children can see themselves represented is extremely important. And one of the reasons I love Matt De La Pena's work and Christian Robinson does a lot of uh, books with him, um, the, the children look like the kids look. And so I think it's very important that, that they're diverse, that they show children in all different environments and different types of clothing and surroundings. And um, I think that it's uh, just very important that, you know, I like to choose books where we can make sure that we're engaging kids in a thoughtful conversation. And so super drawn to this book and especially the image that we went over um, in terms of um, what was happening in that family with the piano. I think that a book that allows us to talk to children, to get children to talk um, is super important because we need to have these conversations. So books that will stimulate conversation, extremely important. Thanks, Jackie. Um, a question from Maggie is, um, how long would each activity be and how can they be adapted um, to different spaces like a museum or opportunities that are not sort of direct classroom? Um, Micah, can I toss that one to you? No, you're working in a lot of different spaces. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, so that this is truly is a fantastic question. The teacher part of it would be like, I, I would say, the emphasis on is like like Lizzie said too the repeatability, especially when we're talking about these 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 structures. Knowing for kids to come in that's going to be the same every time, at least in some aspect, is is super important. So I would say have your warm up, have your have your opening ritual, and don't change that. And then things from there, if you planned about fifteen minutes per exercise, like for the exercise that I did with everybody, I would guess about fifteen minutes. However, I think. A, a more of an emphasis that I would have is to let it be as long as it takes and also just give space for whatever happens and deal with it in the moment because so many of us uh, can't predict, none of us can predict truly when we're going to be feeling things and certainly the, the children can't. So being, it's so, so rather than it having to be within a certain time frame, which I know is a terrible question when it comes to like, well, I only have 45 minutes. I understand, trust me, understand. But um, having having the student actually have any moment that they're going to have and be with them and to hold that space actually helps not only that kid but anybody else who's who's around and can uh, see that and be there is, is is they're doing the real learning and i don't mean that what we're doing is fake learning i meaning in the ways the intangibles that we learn truly learn by watching other people go through something and we empathize or whatever it is so i would say to Ha have have the space the time uh, be as long as it takes and be super responsive to the room then also about the room itself, like I, like I did here for you, it's it's how can I fill in this blank with something smaller? So like I said, for mine, I usually it's like red light, green light, and somebody starts way back there, and we walk, and we get closer and closer and closer, right? And that can easily be be switched into something else that is totally stationary. And if it isn't dancing with your whole body, if and, and if children aren't comfortable with that too, maybe it's just a face thing, you know, that's just right in the middle, something that is super super silly, um, but. Um, it's, it's kind of hard, but understanding that the component pieces would be very helpful. And I realize we have an advantage because we made it up, but um, break, break it, take it apart, make it yours. I think that would be the biggest, uh, biggest um, advice I could give. Thanks, Micah. I'm going to sneak in one more question looking at what time it is. Um, Lizzie, I'd love to ask this one to you. So we have a question from Ben um, about aging up this work in order to support older students to make it more age appropriate, knowing that you've worked across uh, many age ranges. I wonder if you could speak to how you might approach that. I'd love to. So I, um, I could use this curriculum. I could see it implemented in a middle school, high school classroom um, in exactly this way. <laughs> I would tell the kids that um, they are going to be 
leading workshops or performing small plays for younger students. And then I would lead them through exactly these exercises, engaging with the book and have them do embodiment um, practices such as playing out what's happening on the page, on specific pages, making sure that it was very safe feeling for whoever was wanting to be involved. And then train the students to facilitate conversations with younger students about the book. So I would literally read the book with the older kids, do the exercises and build in intense debriefs of like, what did you like about that? What worked? What could you see working with your younger siblings and cousins? What wouldn't work? What would lose their attention? And then have them practice facilitating it with each other and then bring them into a setting partnering with a younger classroom where they would be implementing it for them because it's double powerful. I mean, it's double powerful to internalize it. And then it's, it's the second level to be able to then implement it, which makes you the person that is able to be come to for help. And, you know, I think we're all very into inner child work. And I just think it gets at that too. So I just feel like that's one way I would do it. I have, um, oh, we're running out of time. I use children's book in middle school classrooms all the time also because the combination of illustrations and text is rife for theater building. So you can devise pieces off of children's books all the time. And if the books are so rich and complex like this one, it's just, you know, the theater is right there for the making. Okay, I'll end on that. What a what an exciting way to end though. So many things to take with you. So um, I actually wanna take something about what, what Alka put in the chat that I don't think we have time for and just name, you know, worse, I'm so interested in staying connected to this work. Um, she asked about lasting effects of these exercises for, for students. And as CCT, as you are able to re-enter classrooms, as you pilot this curriculum, um, I really hope that we can continue this conversation. Um, I wanna thank all the panelists, all the attendees who are here today, uh, Chicago Children's Theater, the Center for Childhood Resilience at Lurie Children's Hospital, the Illinois Humanities for their support. If you want to relive any of this and see this again, the webinars uh, will have been recorded and full versions along with closed captioning will be available soon on Chicago Children's Theater's website. Um, and thank you so much for joining us today. And I wish all of you uh, a safe and happy end of 2020. <laughs>